Welcome, everybody, to Pants on Fire, Exposing Ruling Class Lies. Today's episode, we're joined once again by historian and professor of history and also member of the Peace and Solidarity Commission of CPUSA, Norman Markowitz. Welcome back, Norman. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much for having having me in this very difficult situation. I'll begin with this introductory statement. Today, the world watches as escalating atrocities characterize the war raging in Gaza. In the nations of the U.S. NATO bloc, the major capitalist countries, most media blame the ultra-right Hamas forces in Gaza and ignore the actions of the ultra-right government of Israel over decades in the region. Many others, particularly some on the left, but throughout the other areas of the world, uh, condemn Israel alone as a Zionist fascist state and ignore the role not only of Hamas, but of the long history of the conflict and its relationship to both imperialism, the post-World War II Cold War, and in that period, the huge increase of the importance of oil as a natural resources for industrial development. Let me quickly make a short historical analysis of the events, and then I'll take questions from Kyle. First, when World War I ended, Israel and Palestine, including Jordan, became, quote, British colonial mandates, de facto colonies. Uh, But by the end of World War II, the British Empire was collapsing. When the region during World War I was part of Germany's ally, the Ottoman Turkish Empire, Britain promised the region to both Jewish settlers to establish a Jewish state and also in other treaties with France to the Arabic population. During the mandate, Britain played both sides against each other and sought to develop the region uh, for its own profit. The Zionist movement from the outset was sharply divided. Left Zionists, which we can go into later in greater detail, militant socialists established socialist-oriented collectives called kibbutzim. In the center, social democrats supported economic and social policies comparable to European social democracy. Their leaders, particularly David David Ben Gurion and his successor Golda Meir would emerge as the dominant group among the Jewish settlers and would lead the nation from 1948 to 1977. On the right, a so-called Zionist revisionist movement, it was called revisionist because it challenged what was the center-left majority of the Zionist movement, led by a man named Vladimir Yavatinsky, called for the creation of a Jewish state that would drive out the Arabic population and isolate itself from all nations. It had no sympathy for socialism, no sympathy for the workers' movement. One of its slogans summed up what it was about, two of its slogans, excuse me, quote, the Gentile is our enemy, and the second slogan, Jewish children, put down your books and pick up your guns. Menachem Begin, the disciple of Yabotinsky, who would die in 1940, in the United States, would lead this movement during the Second World War uh, and afterwards uh, as the political leader of right parties, right wing parties, until he would become to power in 1977, 1978. And eventually, through various alliances with the religious right, would establish over time an aggressive policy of forced settlements in territories under Israeli occupation. Today, and since the late 1990s, uh, the leader of a number of Israeli governments, Benjamin Netanyahu, a man who had gone to school in the United States, who had uh, been a friend in the 1970s, later Republican candidate Mitt Romney, who had known and befriended and had been befriended by Donald Trump at the time of Trump's 
development as a media celebrity in the 1980s, representing, in a sense, the Donald Trump of Israel. In a, he is to Donald Trump what Menachem Begin, in a sense, was to uh, Ronald Reagan, to make that example or that connection, has actively opposed all agreements to go back to some version of the original United Nations partition of the region into Jewish and Arab Palestinian states and has been the leading figure in advancing in a more aggressive way the policies that really began after the Six-Day War of 1970, uh, 1967 and advanced extensively under Begin and much more so over the last two decades of Israeli Jewish settlers settling in the territories occupied by the Israeli military and driving out by force Palestinian Arabs. Okay, okay. If you got one or two more minutes, I'll make a few comments on the Palestinians. A Jewish state was established in 1948. Initially, and this is ironic, with the support of the Soviet Union and the U.S., and in terms of the weapons that it received, not from the U.S., not from Britain, which had an arms embargo against all sides that objectively helped the Arabic countries, which Britain was privately supporting, but from Czechoslovakia under the leadership of the uh, then of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. One of the um, many, many ironies, the active and the active opposition of all Arabic countries, still largely under the control of Britain and its success of the United States. In, 19, in the 1920s, Britain had brought into power and influence a pan-Arab Muslim nationalist, Amin al-Husayni, uh, who had led Arabs against the British mandate and also against Jewish settlers in 1920, engaging in armed struggle against forces then led by Yabotinsky, and made him Grand Rufti of Jerusalem. He continued to hold this position and what would happen over and over again in this region, uh, what the CIA would call blowback in 1936, led armed uprisings against the British settlers and against the British mandate and also the Jewish settlers. He then fled to what was then French colonial Lebanon. In 1940, representatives of al Husayni met with uh, the German foreign minister, uh, Joachim von Ribbentrop, and offered his support as World War II was raging to the German and Italian Axis. In 1941, uh, he supported is issuing a religious fatwa an uprising in Iraq against British colonial rule. The purpose of this uprising was to force Brit Brit the British to send more troops to suppress the uprising and thus help the German military commander in North Africa, Erwin Rommel, to defeat the British forces in Egypt and gain control of the Panama Canal. This Not the Panama, oh my God, I'm sorry. The... Uh, the Suez Canal, he fled and eventually made his way to Germany, where Hitler appointed him head of all Muslims in occupied Europe. He later served as the titular head of the uh, a division of, uh, of often SS division of Muslims recruited from Bosnia, which had been part of Yugoslavia, but as Yugoslavia had been split apart by the Germans and their Croatian fascist allies, the Ustasha, now was uh, playing a very different role and uh, continued his activities. Netanyahu, by the way, created a great 
crisis in Israeli media when he announced that Al Husayni, which is complete nonsense, had convinced Hitler, he had met with Hitler in 1941, to launch the genocide. That is complete nonsense. And there's massive evidence to support that. What Al Husseini did was to proclaim his commitment to an alliance with the fascist Axis, who both had common enemies, the British Empire, the Jews generally, and the communists. Al Husseini, after the war, while he would live till the 1970s, uh, no one would capture him. No one would, there were calls to assassinate him. This would not be done from a variety of sources, including Israeli sources, because they saw him as an incompetent blowhard and uh, feared that he would be replaced with someone who would be more competent, more significant. Hamas basically continues in its creation in the 1980s with the support, the direct support and funding of Israeli intelligence, what Al Husseini represented. But before, uh, if I still have time, and then I'll take questions, we have to look at a man who is far more important and far more positive than certainly Al Husseini. His name was Yasser Arafat. He was born in Cairo in 1929. As a teenager, he fought in the first Arab-Israeli war. He later, with sympathies that were more pro-socialist or pro-progressive, uh, would organize after the second Arab-Israeli war, in which Israel allied itself with Britain and France in a kind of attempted, failed neo-colonial war over the Suez Canal in 1956. He organized a group known as Al Qaid al Fatah to fight against the influence of other Arabic countries. And essentially the war was a war, the conflict was a conflict between Israel and Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq, other Arabic countries, and the Palestinians were in the middle. And they were the victims. They were the primary victims of what was happening. Arafat group after the third war in which Israel would occupy all of the territories that the United Nations had given initially in 1948 in terms of the, the, the partition for the creation of an Arabic state would emerge as the leader of an organization that the Arabic state through the Arab League had created, a Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO. Arafat would serve as the principal leader, involving himself in many, many activities, struggling for the liberation of the people of Palestine until his death at the beginning of the 20th century. He was the main enemy of the various governments of Israel, which is why they funded and helped to create the Hamas group centered in the Gaza Strip in, 19, in the 1980s. Uh, and he also, influenced by the Arabic liberation movement in Algeria in the 1950s, began to apply tactics of attacking not only military and police targets, but also civilian targets in Israel, tactics, and not only in Israel, but in the areas where the Palestinian Liberation Organization was centered, also in Jordan, under uh, Jordanian control, and in the Golan Heights region, under Syrian control. Okay, following his death, and the intensification of the forced settlements and violence directed against the people primarily of Gaza, the Hamas won a major election in 2006. And over the last 17 years, Hamas and Israel have engaged in 
conflict after conflict, which has claimed many more Jewish lives than the previous conflicts, but also in much, much greater numbers than lives of Palestinians who find themselves caught in the middle in what is an endless and escalating war. Okay, I'm finished, Kyle. I hope I didn't go that long, but... No, that's great. And I, I appreciate the, the background. I have a few questions uh, based on some of the things you said, and I'll go out of order because some of the some of these items I want to yeah. wait on. But you talked about the, the socialist oriented collectives there early on and then this right wing sort of Zionist revisionist movement that yeah. came around. And was that happening organically or were there other countries that were involved in kind of pushing that? I don't see other countries supporting in any direct way Yabotinsky or subsequently in any direct way Begin. There is a, a person who I was going to talk about. It may just take a minute or so. It deals with a man who has been written out of the history of Israel and is really a fascinating figure a really fascinating figure. What would have happened had he lived? Who knows? Who can uh, only tell? But his his name was Bor, B-O-R, Borachov. Uh, why is he important? He was a Ukrainian Jewish intellectual who considered himself a Marxist. And he, uh, after the death of Theodor Herzl, who had been the major founder at the end of the 19th century, of what became the Zionist movement, bringing it uh, to both European and the U.S. Uh, the U.S. world, Borachov, at the time of the revolution in Russia of 1905, had looked at the class struggle and its relationship to the national question, particularly the Jewish question. He became the leader of a group called Polai Zion, or the Workers of Zion. Uh, that championed both the return of Jews to Palestine, where he believed they would become a real proletariat, not the shifting petty bourgeois and lumpen proletariat that they were in Europe. And he also believed that the Jewish workers would unite with the Arab workers to form a revolutionary class that would overthrow the semi-feudal Turkish Empire and move in the direction of establishing a Jewish state. Unlike David Ben-Gurion, who would be ultimately far more important, he saw Yiddish, the language of the impoverished Jewish ghetto dwellers, as the language of Jewish people. He continued to actively campaign for a Jewish state with the revolution in Russia in 1917 and the victory of the Bolsheviks. He returned in November and participated in the Congress of Nationalities that the Soviet, the in, the in their first months of existence, the very first months, the Soviets had called for and continued to support Jewish settlement under these conditions in Palestine. Unfortunately, he died in December 1917. And after his death, Polai Zion split. The left wing initially formed the Borachov Brigade and fought with the Red Army. The left wing in Russia, in the Russian Civil War, abandoned the idea of a return to Palestine, initially forming a Jewish Communist Party and then joining directly the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The right wing, which would become the major force in Israel, although elements of the left would create not only the kibbutzim, which I talked about, but also political parties to the left of the dominant right-wing social democratic party, which called itself Mapai. Uh, their parties were called Mepam, and in the decades to come. Okay, 
did uh was there a possibility that uh Gorbachev's principles and ideas would have advanced in Palestine among the Jewish settlements? Well, certainly the British would have actively and aggressively suppressed them, much more so than they suppressed either Ben-Gurion or Yabotinsky in a direct way. Uh, and given the conflict which was developing between Arabic people, Arabs so-called, and the Jewish and the Jewish settlements, it's very unlikely, I think, that it could have really been successful. Hmm. So what was the uh the uh, the need, I guess, for for a Jewish state and a return to Palestine? And that was happening in was that post-World War One? Yes. Well, the need began to be seen by Theodore Herzl, who was uh, an Aus a Viennese Austrian journalist, intellectual, in the nineteen in the eighteen nineties. His book, The Jewish State, really at the end of the eighteen nineties, introduced large numbers of people to the very idea of a Jewish state. He had been influenced, first of all by what was happening in his home city of Vienna, where a nationalist demagogue named Karl Lueger combined programs of economic and social reform with rabid anti-Semitism. Although he did not attack directly Jews as such in terms of his policies, but his rhetoric incited hatred and violence against Jewish people. But most of all, the case, the world famous Dreyfus case in France, where a Jewish French officer on the general on the French general staff was made a scapegoat in an espionage case in which he was entirely innocent, sent to Devil's Island after his conviction and this became the center for the rise of rabid demagogic anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish racism, which is what it was, and a movement that many saw as a precursor and a model for the later fascist and particularly Nazi movements of the 20th century. He was an organized tirelessly for the creation of a Jewish state, sought as a, as a kind of intellectual and politician to win support for it in all possible circles. And the intensification of anti-Jewish violence and terror massacres called pogroms, which would grow as monopoly capitalism developed in Europe, as the semi-feudal regimes particularly of, of the Tsarist Russian Empire, faced economic and social dislocations as poor people, the way poor people today in Central America, in Mexico, are being forcibly dislocated by uh, being driven off their land, uh, in effect, by contemporary policies of monopoly capitalism. Uh, trying to emigrate, trying to flee. The tactic of blaming Jews for this became more and more widespread, leading to more and more atrocities. And it was those atrocities that would influence everyone. It influenced Ben-Gurion and actually influenced Yabotinsky, who became involved in the Zionist movement after one of the more notorious of these massacres or pogroms the Kishinev program of 1903. So this was creating the support, however illogical it was, for the creation of a Jewish state. And where could one create such a state? Initially, Herzl had not committed himself to a return to Palestine. But, and there were all kinds of schemes to resettle European Jews 
in areas of Africa, Uganda, for example. Hmm. But it why but it became clear that if you were to win support for Jewish people from for resettlement as against immigration to countries like the United States, which had free immigration, and European countries where Jews were seeking to immigrate at the time. The former lands of ancient Israel and Judea, where there had not been a Jewish state since the first century of the Christian era, was the only possibility. Hmm. So then that brings me to, I guess, my next my next question, which is, you know, what what role does religion play in in this in this conflict? Because I mean, it it goes back to biblical times, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Religion. Uh, the issue really is nationalism manipulated by powerful imperialist states. Uh, hmm. Religion plays a role in that there is a religious component, a significant religious component to both the Zionist movement and from the beginning, there are religious Zionists called Mizrahi, personal uh, memory. My grandmother, Naomi Denenberg, who died three years before I was born, I later found out, and my family were not, they were poor people, they were not well-educated. Living in the Bronx, she was an active religious Zionist who spoke at meetings, and uh, her Hebrew name was Nachma. My Hebrew name is Nachman. I was named for her. But in any case, before the conflicts of the 20th century, both Jews and Muslims for example, had much, much, much better relations with each other than either one of them had with Christians. Hmm. Religious anti-Semitism was rooted in centuries of Christian ideology and policy. Why that was true, one can debate and debate. My, uh, my speculation is that Christianity began as a revolutionary movement inside Judaism, a revolutionary movement that challenged the hierarchy, the uh, the rituals of the rabbinical-dominated Judaism with rabbinical elites in control. And it became, in the context of the, uh, the slave tribute Roman Empire, a revolutionary movement that eventually played a role in the collapse of that empire. But what did Christianity become? A religion of church hierarchies, a religion with more extreme rituals than the Judaism that they had rebelled against. So in a sense, I would say, and this is my view, that the failure of Christianity became a major force in not only their, the Christian churches, particularly the Western church, known, known later as the Catholic church, separating themselves from Judaism in all of its forms, but demonizing Jew, Judaism and Jews. I hope no, that's food for thought. Okay. Is, yeah, definitely. I mean, and I think that's, that's the, the, the role that the Christianity played in, uh, in the, the anti-Jewish yeah. mentality. I mean, you know, we remember some of the stuff that Mel Gibson said in 2004 when his movie came out, The Passion of Christ. Yeah. Oh, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because those those prejudices live on and live on. And, of course, there is clerical fascism, which in Europe was Christian. You could argue that right now, there are strong aspects of clerical fascism, Jewish clerical fascism in Israel, the so-called Jewish Defense League, led by a man named Maya Kahana, who apparently had CIA support. His name was Michael Kane in the United States. He formed a political party called Kach, which reflected 
a Jewish cortical fascism calling for the forced expulsion and even violent terror against the Arabic Muslim population. And uh, one could say that groups like Al-Qaeda, particularly ISIS, seeking to revive the Muslim caliphate that existed, that came into existence something like uh, 1,500 years ago, reflects also this kind of caracal fascism. Hamas, in its initial charter, I would say did reflect caracal fascism also. And so talk about the uh, this, the British the British mandate a little bit, and that's sort of when I'm assuming oil came into play. And oh, yeah. It was, of course, a lot of it was in the Middle East. And so here comes yeah. the British Empire. Yeah, yeah. Here comes the British Empire with a vengeance. They control Iraq, where there is oil. They actually, through the Anglo-Iranian oil company later, they control the oil of Iran. And that is to be with the events that take place in Iran after World War II, the election of a constitutional democratic regime which nationalizes oil under Mohammed Mossadegh. And then in response to that, British intelligence and the US CIA uh, moving in to overthrow Mossadegh and restore now, not as a constitutional monarch, but as a, a divine right dictatorial monarch, the Shah, and then of course, uh, splitting up the oil splitting up the oil with American oil companies getting a substantial part of the oil. And Kermit Roosevelt, who had been the American organizer of the coup in 1953 against uh, Mossadegh, resigning and becoming a vice president of a major American oil company. Uh, hmm. So the, uh, this is the history. And of course, later, one of the main reasons why the U.S., after the Arab-Israeli war, the 1967 war, uh, which is a sweeping victory for Israel. They gained control pretty much all of the territories that had been part of the original partition. Israel then becomes the military middleman for U.S. and uh, its allies' interests in the Middle East, to protect the oil, because there's nobody left who can do that. Uh, in the 50s, Gamal Abdel Nasser had ousted the British-supported king of Egypt and sought to create a secular United Arab Republic by uniting the Arabic nations against Israel. And he had supported in Egyptian uh, guerrilla fighters, Fedayeen, uh, uh, as they were called, against the uh, British, against against Israel, when Nasser developed positive relationships with the Soviet Union, the U.S., which had under Eisenhower uh, offered to fund a major dam for Egypt, the Aswan Dam, withdrew its support in 1956 when Nasser sought to nationalize the Suez Canal. The social democratic government of Israel under Ben-Gurion's leadership joined with the British and French governments as a new Arab-Israeli war broke out and uh, Britain and France sought to seize, take over the Panama Canal from Nasser. It was sabotaged out of that, by the way, in spite of all their conflicts with each other. At the height of the Cold War, the Eisenhower administration and the Khrushchev regime government in uh, the Soviet Union came together to force Britain and France out. In a sense, by the late 1950s, the Soviets were supporting various Arabic, Arab nationalist movements and Nasser's United Arab Republic. And the US and its allies were supporting not so much Israel, but the Jordanians, the Saudis, initially the Iraqis. Then there was a revolution in Iraq socialist-oriented officers. Uh, and then who did the U.S. support? The Ba'ath Party, a pan-Arab nationalist party. And by the 1970s, who had emerged as the leader of that pan-Arab 
Pan-Arabist Nationalist Party. You know Saddam Hussein. So what did Saddam Hussein do? He, in a sense, double-crossed his former friends, the U.S., and he sought to na nationalize the oil, and he developed a relationship with the Soviet Union. And then what? Well, you had the revolution in Iran, and Saddam Hussein, who saw himself as the Napoleon of the region, so to speak, seeing an opportunity to seize Iranian oil with the support of the Carter and then the Reagan administration, launched a bloody eight-year war against Iran, where he used poison gas and the U.S. Uh, with the support of the U.S. in the United Nations. And then when that was over, he was bankrupt economically. He had gotten tons of money from the U.S. allies, uh, Kuwait, uh, Saudi Arabia, etc. He called upon the uh, them to forgive, forgive their loans. They told him by no means, and he invaded Kuwait for the oil and the money. And then what happened? The first Iraq War. Okay, <laughs> uh, and then. Even though he was finished, what happened? The uh, George Bush, the first administration, decided not to eliminate his regime because that would greatly strengthen the Iranians. And what then happened, of course, was another 12 years until in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, which themselves were the result of the Al-Qaeda group, which was created with direct US and CIA support in alliance with Pakistan after Afghani communists had gained leadership over Afghanistan uh, in 1978, 1979, when the Al-Qaeda group, after, uh, Afga after these many conflicts and victories, turned and the Soviet Union no longer existed, turned their hatred and guns on the West, so-called, which they saw as the center of social decay. And uh, their attacks were now on Christian crusaders, Zionist Jews, and the evil Western nations. We see this just throughout, throughout history, time and yeah. again, where yeah. when, when it comes down to it, the U.S. will support uh, far right religious fundamentalists, yeah, extremists yeah. in an effort to oppose any inkling of of communism or, yeah. or, socialism. or socialism, yeah, or any inkling of a movement that will strengthen communism, strengthen revolutionary social forces, or even movements that will simply refuse to give. U.S. monopoly capital and its allies, the economic concessions and power that they demand over and over and over and over again, even before the Soviet revolution. There are examples of this in China uh, with the attempt once the feudal uh, Manchu dynasty was overthrown, Sun Yat-sen's attempt to establish a Democratic Republic, the U.S. withdrawing its support because, and actively supporting uh, a warlord because he uh, named Yuan Shikai, who would give them what they wanted, who would give them exactly what they wanted in terms of economic policy. The British, to go back to Palestine, uh, as part of their appeasement policy with Nazi toward Nazi Germany and facing the growing conflict in Palestine, their white paper of 1939, for all practical purposes, ending Jewish immigration to Palestine at a time when one would say it was most necessary, most needed. And, uh, you know, the subsequent the subsequent conflicts and events. Mm -hmm. And so all the while that this is going on with the British mandate and the British basically telling the Palestinians one thing and the and the uh, Jews another thing. There right. yeah. while yeah. that's happening, there were already Jewish settlers 
there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were Jewish settlers before. There were Jewish settlers who begin to come in at the end of the 19th century. There are significant numbers of Jewish settlers. Ben Gurion is there when World War I breaks out. The Turkish Empire allies itself by uh, with Nazi Germany, not Nazi Germany, with the German Empire of the World War One. Excuse me, it's not Nazi Germany. It's very, very different than Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, and what the Turkish Empire does is launch a brutal expulsion of Jews, particularly from the city of Haifa. Thousands are uh, expelled, and most of them go to what is British the British protectorate of Egypt. They go to Alexandria. From there, many come to the United States where there's free immigration and to other areas. Eventually, many return with the British mandate to Palestine. And so those early settlements that were happening in Palestine, yeah. the relations between Jews and Arabs were not that bad, right? I mean, they were... Yeah. Yeah, they were nowhere near as bad as they would become in the period of the mandate. I so that um, I think because a lot of a lot of people will compare the uh, the Jewish state to what happened with the United States, where the colonialists came over from Britain yeah. and basically drove out the uh, the native population that was yeah. in the Americas, yeah, the indigenous people. Yeah, but it's, it's in a way it is. It is different. Uh, you can make that. Uh, many of my friends support the idea of settler colonialism, but in general, it avoids the larger framework of class struggle, of mode of production, and also of imperialism generally. So I would not make that. I don't see that as, as, as central. The issue, the major issue here, to me, is the role of nationalism. You know, we had talked about proletarian internationalism in my earlier discussion. Proletarian internationalism versus nationalism. The nationalism of the oppressed. And hmm. both the Zionist movement in its early history and the Palestinian national movement in much of its history has reflected the nationalism of the oppressed. The nationalism of the oppressed, if it does not broaden and become part of a larger internationalism, and this happens over and over again, it becomes the nationalism of the oppressor, of mm. oppressive nationalism. And this would happen, let's say, in Poland in the late 19th and early 20th century. Joseph Pilsudski was the founder in the 1890s of the Polish Socialist Party. He was the ruthless reactionary, but not his regime in the interwar period, uh, not only had nothing to do with socialism, but was anti-socialist, anti-communist, and encouraged anti-Semitism, among other things. Not to mention attacks on Orthodox Christians in occupied Poland areas. Uh, and we find this over and over and over again. And that's, I think, a major point in under in looking at what has happened and what continues to happen. Let me say that we've talked about the history. The situation right now is very, very bad. Netanyahu's government has no interest and Netanyahu himself, uh, going back to the 1970s, has never had any interest or support for a binational, for two states, a two-state solution, which the United Nations called for. There have been uh, Arafat accepted in principle a two-state solution before his death, but conflicts with the government of Israel the rightist governments in Israel, the murder by a right-wing Zionist of Itzhak Rabin in the 1990s essentially destroyed whatever possibility there was 
of such a settlement. Uh, mm -hmm. Peace now, uh, a ceasefire, which is what our party stands for and is called for, a settlement with the withdrawal of Israeli military forces from Gaza, which is what our party stands for, a return to the United Nations call for a legitimate Palestinian state, a legitimate Palestinian state, and a policy of economic rehabilitation. Uh, after World War II, the, the United Nations established the UN Relief and Rehabilitation Agency, known as UNRWA, to try to rehabilitate and reconstruct devastated regions and economies. That, I would say, is right now desperately needed. As for Hamas, finding ways through international action and control to break its influence, uh, hopefully short of warfare, is necessary. At the same time, the present government of Israel, the government that continues in a much more extreme way the policies associated with Vladimir Yabotinsky first, then the policies that began to be put into effect by Menachem Begin uh, when he came to power, the policies that are the equivalent of what Donald Trump represented in the United States, but policies that the Israeli government has then has carried forward with great violence. It would be like Trump's launching an invasion of northern Mexico to deal with the quote, illegal immigration problem, and forcing out significant numbers of people, claiming those areas, going back to the, uh, the territorial demands that were put forward in the, in the 1840s to seize areas of much of what is now northern Mexico, going back to that. It would be, and then establishing American settlers to force out Mexicans. It would be similar to that. Okay, I got going in my usual way. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's I think you know we've we've talked about the history. We've talked about the some of the parts of history that I don't think we we hear much about, which is no, no, just fascinating. Don't. And I think one of the things that that's interesting is how Netanyahu will talk about Hamas being the enemy and Hamas is you know a terrorist organization yet he supports or supported Hamas as a like an alternative to well, Israel did that Israel the Israeli intelligence really really did that let me if I have a second or so there is an article in the intercept a good article which quotes Israeli intelligence officials. Uh, yeah, and they use the CIA term blowback. The first is from Brigadier General Yitzhak Segev, the military governor of uh, Gaza under Begin. He later told actually the New York Times that, uh, quote, Hamas was initially seen as a counterweight to quote the left elements of the the Palestine Liberation Organization, led by Yasser Arafat. Arafat also called Hamas a quote creature of Israel. Uh, General Segev says, "quote The Israeli government gave me a budget to do this." Hmm. Another former Israeli official who worked in Gaza as the religious official, later told the Wall Street Journal, Hamas, to my great regret, his name was Abner Kohn, to my great regret, was Israel's creation. And he later said, uh, quote, even though he warned his higher-ups not to do this in the occupied territories, 
uh, I suggested that we should focus our ways on trying to break up this monster before reality jumps in our face. And of course, reality did, in a direct way, jump in uh, the face of Israel. And uh, since they had come to power, and now the situation has gotten worse, Israel has sought to, quote, bomb and blockade Hamas out of existence. And uh, these conflicts have produced nearly now the numbers are escalating like crazy. And Hamas at the same time has uh, killed more Israeli civilians than any other Palestinian group from the inception of the conflicts from 1948 on. And this is a final quote. David Hakam, who was the uh, advisor on Arabic affairs, for the Israeli military who was based in Gaza in this the period when this policy began. When I look back at the events, I think we made a mistake. But at the time, nobody thought about the possible results. Hmm. That, that is history. Certainly the, uh, the Americans did not think about the possible results 25 years later when they overthrew Mossadegh and instituted the Shah. The Americans did not think about the possible effects 22 years later uh, when they began their support for the Afghan freedom fighters who became the Taliban and uh, Al-Qaeda later on. And uh, Isra the Israelis in no way considered the consequences of their support for Hamas against the Palestine Liberation Organization and Yasser Arafat. As a historian, does it does it bother you to see history just repeat over and over again? Because... Yeah. Well, it's miserably depressing. Karl Marx did write famously that history repeats itself the first time as tragedy the second time as farce, and he was talking about Napoleon uh, the third, the little Napoleon. But uh, history, ultimately, while Marx wrote about the dead hand of history, breaking the hopes of generations of people in the present struggling for positive social change, we have to understand and learn. And with the right framework, we can find a way to advance the interests of the working class, people's movements, and socialism. And in this context, in this context, an international solution, which we must fight for, beginning with a ceasefire, and then being carried forward in a policy of an internationally supervised creation of a real, not a paper, Palestinian state that would function not only alongside the Jewish state of Israel, but would develop economic and political bonds with that state for regional economic development is the solution that we must fight for because the only alternative is more war and more war and the possibility of a much bigger war, one in which Israel, which does have nuclear weapons, which it denies, could lead to catastrophe. Well, Norman, I really appreciate you coming on to talk about this and to yeah, well, tell us a bit about the, the history. And I think that we'll just have to wait and see what happens, but yeah, it's yeah. Certainly, not, certainly not looking good. No, it's not looking good. I wish... I could find a way to be more positive. Uh, and I thought about this and thought about this a great deal. But uh, uh, in terms of being positive, my last comments are pretty much all that I can do, Kyle. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Kyle.
Thank you for listening to Pants on Fire, Exposing Ruling Class Lies, the podcast produced by the International Department of CPUSA. Visit our website, cpusa.org, to learn more about the party. Follow us on Twitter at CPUSA Department, and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app.